terribly excited to introduce the next speaker, who is Alison Burns, who's come from the University of Manchester, so I'd like to hand over to Alison. Okay, thank you very much for welcoming me here today. It's, um, it's been a bit of a rush to get here, but I'm really glad to be here to participate in this with you. Um, so I've been looking at the footprints for about um, seven or eight years now. I'm going to go through the paleo environment of Form B um, as it would have been just after the last ice, ice age leading up to around about um, BC. Um, and then I'm going to look at the footprints and then very briefly I'll go into the recording methodology that I've used. So um, just to be clear where Form B is, I'm sure you all know, but I've highlighted it in that little red dot there. Um, it's a little cusp of land which sticks out um, into the um, Irish Sea um, and therefore is quite prone to coastal erosion and change, particularly at the moment it's losing several metres of um, dune each year, which is why we're beginning to see lots of new outcrops of mud um, appear on the beach. So they happen in um, an alignment along here, about uh, stretching for about four kilometres. Um, they're not always visible, but more often than not, if you were to go down onto the beach, you would see one outcrop. Um, it does change, as I'm saying, the, the um, beach is being steadily changed by erosion, so the mud appearance changes with it too. So just to take you back to the end of the last ice age, which was around about 9,500 BC, the sea level was much, oh, sorry, much lower than it is now, you can see here, almost 30 metres lower. Um, and as the ice caps melted at the end of the last ice age and the climate warmed, um, sea levels rose very rapidly. Um, and there was a shift in the Earth's crust as well. So areas to the north of Morecambe Bay rose, so you get raised beaches in Scotland, and areas to the south sank. Um, and Formby was on the hinge of that area, so was subjected to um, some sea level rise, but um, not as extensive as further south. It was a very fluctuating and dynamic environment up to around about 4000 BC. So this would have been the Morecambe Bay um, around about 7000 BC. Um, it was a time when it was being rapidly flooded, and you can see here um, the large intertidal area here um, and this was being forced eastwards quite rapidly as these lower areas of land were being submerged. Um, so as I was saying this is a, a period of change, quite significant change um, and it would have affected the people living in the area but because of this change um, we were hearing earlier about sandbanks um, also developing and changing and moving. And so it's thought that a series of sandbanks actually um, developed around the coast here, protecting this area inland here, which was beginning to become flooded, but wasn't fully flooded at that time. And this enabled tributaries going onto the coast to deposit their load into this um, calmer area between the land and the sandbanks. And within these areas, very, very large um, mud flats and reed beds and an intertidal area developed there. So this is the kind of environment that would have been present um, at the edge of the coastline. You can see here the mud flats and then behind them reed beds and behind these again stands of trees. And this was how it would have been at Formby and along the whole stretch of that Sefton coast. It was very similar to this. And this um, wetland extended at least two or three miles inland. So it was quite an extensive area um, of wetland behind the marshland. Um, people like to inhabit the sand ridges that are found and one or two um, small raised escarpments as well. But you can imagine that it was quite difficult to navigate in a very wet 
um, marshy land and so it may have been that the coast was very attractive to people because they could actually walk more comfortably on the mud flats um, at the edge of the sea than further inland. So it was very attractive for humans and animals. This is something like it would have looked like, obviously this is a, a modern picture, but um, this is a kind of salt marsh environment that would have existed. And at the far edge of that, you would have had the mud flats. So the life at Formby was traveling across a wetland, traveling across a marshland to get to the mud flats. It would have been a very open environment. Um, it would have been protected from the open sea. And certainly in the summer, it appears to have been very calm, um, very warm. It appears that um, it may have been quite breezy at times. We've got lots of small particles of sand that were blown into the footprints. Um, it would also have been an area where humans and animals could see each other. They would have knowledge of each other within this environment and in many ways shared the landscape as they moved through it. So bringing us up to more modern times, um, you can see here how the coastline up to 1906 at Formby actually accreted. The, the dunes and the land progressed further to the west but since that time, it's been steadily eroded, and that's the process which is still happening today. And here we have the, the beds at Formby, um, from the, the north to the south here. So this is this four kilometre stretch, which relates to this here. Um, and I've highlighted here the different outcrops as, as they've been studied. Occasionally, you do get other areas up here as well, uh, which haven't been recorded. So it can make the actual recording of the footprints in a systematic way quite difficult um, because you have to know the beach really well to actually understand whether or not you're looking at something again that has been recorded five years before or whether you're actually looking at something that's completely new and that is only now exposed because of the dunes being pushed back. So this is what the dunes, sorry, this is what the mudflats look like in different areas. So sometimes they, they form plates like this that are outcrop on the beach, slightly proud of the sand. Occasionally, this northern bed at Gypsy Path um, actually outcrops quite significantly, and you can see the whole depth of the bed. It's exposed in different layers, and it's just around about 30 centimetres thick. But quite often you get beds like this, which are just exposed because of the um, longshore drift carving away areas of sand from the mud um, and exposing the mud at the edge of a runnel. Um, and this is why the beds are quite transient, because um, they, the sand comes and goes from on top of them, depending on the tides and the weather. So the older beds are the beds down here at Wicks Path and Blundell Path here. Um, the newer beds are further north. And it's quite a complicated picture to, to work out the dating because you would tend to assume that all the beds in an area were of roughly the same age, but at Formby they're definitely not. And I've seemed to spend a lot of time in the last couple of years um, in a laboratory working out what the actual um, stratigraphy and dates of Formby was. Um, so here we have a core, this is just about a metres deep core, and you can see that initially the area was um, a sandy area without any um, silt whatsoever. This is a silt unit here. But then very suddenly really, the, the pally environment must have changed, and the tide um, and the water, the salt water, must have receded from the area, and this enabled the mud to actually collect from the tributaries coming down onto that intertidal marshland. Um, these are plant macrofossils that I've used to radiocarbon date this bed at Gypsy Path. So this is the northern bed and the newest bed. Um, and this is this silt section here. Um, when these beds are eroded, they, they form different plates, different layers, and each of the layers contains in the top of it um, 
footprints made by different animals and people depending on where the bed is. Um, so this is a bed in the middle, this is the Blundell Path bed that I mentioned to you. Um, and you can see here that the, the paleo environment when this bed formed was very different. This bed was subjected to inundations and periods of dry, um, repeatedly being swept by the sea and maybe flooded for indeterminate periods of time as well. Um, these marks here, these are where erosion marks occur. So you can see that the sea was quite rough and it was changing the paleo environment of that mudflat um, during its existence. And here we have four main contexts, four main layers of footprints that have been described. Um, some of the layers, as you get towards the lower part of the core, um, are only very partially visible, so you tend not to be able to see very many footprints in them. But if you are able to clear back that layer, I'm sure there will be just as many uh, types and um, numbers of footprints as there were at a later date. So this, this is quite an early bed, and you can see here, um, this is quite an early date, around about 7000 BC. So these, this is the bed at Blundell Path as well. Um, so this bed dates from the Mesolithic period, the Middle Stone Age. So we know it was um, in existence between 7,000 and around about 5,000 years ago, after which time it was, it was covered. Um, and here you can see cracks in the mud. Um, and <coughs> these would have actually occurred when the bed was forming during the summer months. So um, we know that the area was quite hot at times and enabled the mud to dry out to an extent that it would crack. Um, and these are the, the contexts that we record the different footprints in. Um, I don't know what it's like at Walney, but you may have mud beds there that have similar layering um, features to them. And one of the things that I've established through my recording is trying to make sure that when we record things, we record them in their context. Because you may have noticed that there's quite a variation in dates from the lower part of the silt to the upper part. And so to get um, a more accurate idea of the um, cultural date of the footprint, it's very useful to have the context as well that you're recording into. So um, these footprints were formed over a period of time, over quite an um, extended period of time. Um, and the process was really the same whenever they occurred. Um, first of all, the silt was laid down, um, and then it would have been able to um, dry out to a certain extent, at which point the life walked within it. Um, it was then baked quite hard so it would retain the footprint. Some of the beds are much um, drier than others and would have been drier in antiquity as well. Um, so, you know, each bed is quite distinctive in its own right. Um, and then water would have been borne in by the sea carrying quite large amounts of sand, which would have filled the footprint. Baking would then have occurred and more sediment would have lain on top of that to form a lid. So in effect, that footprint would be sealed for the millennia that it was um, covered up by other mud and other sands on top of it. So this process can really only have occurred here during the spring and summer months. So the activity that we're talking about um, wasn't recorded during the winter months. It, it would have needed the right conditions in order to be preserved. This is Gordon Roberts um, with a prized find of a red deer antler set. Um, this was found in the sediment at Blundell Path um, when he was doing a guided walk. Um, and they did the right thing, they didn't hook it out of the mud, they left it there and they recorded its location and they carefully excavated it and it was then, part of it was then sent for radiocarbon dating and it came back with a Neolithic date. Um, so, the radiocarbon dating that I've been doing um, has stretched, the, has spanned the whole of the Formby Point area, and this um, is the earliest date that I've got from Wicks Path here. 
Um, and in this bed at Wicks Path, there were aurochs prints, red deer and roe deer prints. Um, it's, it's quite sparsely um, used, but nevertheless, the, the prints are, are in there. And then the newest bed that I have dated is the one that I was talking about at Gypsy Path, which actually goes in its existence right up to the medieval period. However, the onset of this bed also appears to have been slightly later. So it may be that there was some kind of paleo channel running between the, the northern beds and the more middle and southern beds, um, which enabled a different environment to develop at a slightly later time at Gypsy Path. But the other thing is that we know that at Blundell Path and Wicks Path, um, at around about 2000 BC, the area was then covered up as coastline moved further west. Um, and we know that because these older routes were dated. And these routes would have grown down into the mud beds. Um, and you do actually still find little tendrils of roots sticking up through the footprints every now and again. Um, so we know in that area, any of the footprints must have um, been formed before that time. So I'm going to move on to the footprints themselves now. Um, here we have uh, red deer and roe deer. Um, and I'm going to just run you through the animal footprints um, because this is one of the reasons that we're here, I think, is to look um, and see what you might have at Walney and see if you have any of these creatures in the mud here. So I'm hopefully going to educate you as to how to look for them um, and perhaps where to look for them as well. Um, so here is um, a set of roe deer hoof prints. Um, roe deer are, were quite a small and sprightly animal and you can see that from the hoof marks there. Um, the cleaves, which are these marks here, um, are at the front of the hoof and when they're open um, it means that the animal was moving at some speed. So we can see here that that there is quite rapid movement across the mud flat. The red deer, by contrast, um, were not um, in the same flighty manner at all, although they obviously did move at speed every now and again. But um, this is a good track of red deer prints heading towards the south. Um, one of the things that I always do is make sure that I carry some sort of scale with me. And you'll notice through my presentation that my favoured method seems to change daily. Um, so forgive all the different scales. I've tried to describe the, the, scrape, the scale by the bar at the bottom there so that you get an understanding. Um, so the red deer were the most prolific animal on the marshes. Um, their footprints are found in every single bed and their numbers outweigh any of the other creatures. They were significantly bigger than the breed of red deer that we have today. Um, sorry, this, this is the roe deer again. Um, and you can see here that their the, um, hooves are actually quite small. Um, and you always have a sort of a U shape at the back of the hoof and quite a sharp um, cleave to the hoof. And that's how you can tell the difference between a small roe deer and a small red deer, because sometimes they do look very similar. And these, um, these are the red deer hoof prints. This, in particular, was a fantastic hoof. Um, you can see it's probably 17 centimetres long, which is uh, indicating a very large animal. Um, and you can also see that, at times, it moved quickly. You can see the open cleaves there and the back of the hoof is actually lifted up so you get quite a, a V-shape um, from the hoof itself. Another feature of a red deer hoof is that one of the cleaves will generally be smaller in its impression than the other. So it has a, a major part of the foot and then a, a smaller part of the foot as well. One of the other features that happens at Formby sometimes is that you get the remnants of a hoof imprint still sitting on top of the layer that is currently going to be eroded. So here you have 
a hoof print from an earlier time than this hoof print here. And, and so these animals may, may have been walking across this mud flat, um, maybe you know, a couple of hundred years apart. But when you see them on the beach, they look as if they were contemporary to each other. But it's always worth looking for these um, plinths as well as the impressions, because they can give you quite a lot of information. So um, sometimes it's quite difficult to tell uh, one animal from another. Here we have um, an aurochs print here. Do you know what an aurochs was? It was a type of wild cattle. Um, quite a big beast and um, <clears throat> known for being quite ferocious really. Um, they were significantly bigger than our contemporary cattle that we have today. Um, so they would have stood about six foot high at the shoulder and they had very big horns and they were known to be very fierce. Uh, they died out in the UK in the Bronze Age um, but they died out in, in Europe in the 1700s. Um, and they, they were here in quite large numbers. I think there, there was um, an aurochs skeleton at the Preston Museum. I don't know if it's still there. Um, there's certainly one in the London Museum, a skull in the London Museum, which is very impressive. Um, but the aurochs, uh, because it was a type of cattle, has a, a typically rounded um, footprint. And the sort of frog at the back of the hoof is here. So, it's quite difficult sometimes because you can think, oh, this is a, a red deer because this is the cleave here and here, but actually it's not. Um, you have to look at the overall shape of the impression to understand what you're looking at. And here we have another aurochs print and into it has registered the back hoof as well. And this is typical of the pattern of an animal walking forwards like that. The prints at the bottom are red deer, um, and you can see that, that they are quite a different shape, that they've got a more um, elongated hoof at the side, at the lateral edge, um, and they have quite a clean cut at the back where the hoof finishes. Sometimes the aurochs also has um, a pedicle mark at the back here, um, but at Formby, this doesn't seem to have been one of the, the impressions that, that has been left very often. It's normally just the hoof mark that you get. So again here, the aurochs um, hoof print, because the animal was heavy, has been left as a plinth. Um, it's partially eroded, but nevertheless, you get the idea of the, the shape of the hoof. And this hoof, you can see, was around about 22 centimetres long. Um, I think modern cattle don't get beyond about 12 centimetres in length for their hooves. They're, they're much smaller than this. So it gives you an idea of the size of the animal. And sometimes um, you can see aurochs and red deer prints together in the mud. So here we have the rounded aurochs hoof marks, um, but also red deer hooves down here as well. Um, and red deer and aurochs seem to have liked to be in the same environment, but they wouldn't have been within that salt marsh at the same time, because the aurochs was um, an animal that would have liked to have been there during the day, probably to wallow, to keep cool, maybe to drink the brackish water, whereas the red deer would have been there more frequently during the early morning and the early evening. So although we get a snapshot that seems to suggest they were all there at the same time, they weren't. This is um, an area of footprint that developed over time. Um, here again, I just thought I'd show you these because they're so good. These are Oryx footprints at Wick's Path, and you can see um, the stride of the animal here. It's a big animal. As it moved forward, it really pushed the mud out of the way, you can see the ripples here, and you can see the full length of the hoof as well. Um, and by contrast, you can see the red deer hooves there, much, much neater and much more um, <coughs> neat, really, in their whole appearance. Um, of the birds that were present, there were an array of birds. Um, there were crane like this, um, whose imprints are very large and very noticeable. Each toe prong was about 10 centimetres long. 
So the width of the foot overall was about 20 centimetres, which is a considerable length. Um, and they were um, probably roosting in the trees behind the marshes and would have come down onto the mud flats to feed. Uh, one of the other features that we have within the mud are these little marks here. And these are actually um, mollusks remains that from a piddock that would have been um, in there and um, moved the mud, attached itself into the mud, and then when it died, it was eroded out, but it leaves a hole. Um, and these marks are, are quite common. You can actually see a shell, I think, in situ up here. Um, with animals like the crane, you don't always get the full footprint. You sometimes get just a partial footprint. Um, and so you, it, it's very helpful to understand the appearance of the footprint so that you can tease out what you're actually looking at. For instance, here there's two of a three, three prongs. Here there's just one. But we can see throughout this area that this was a, a bed in which several crane were moving around in different directions. Another animal that was quite prolific was the oyster catcher and we seem to find their footprints just at the edge of a layer. I think um, because the impressions are not very deep, when the bed has had the tide cover it several times after the layer of mud has been exposed, it actually wears away the print itself so you lose it fairly quickly so an area to look for oyster catcher prints it's just at the edge um, peeping out from under a layer of higher mud above it um, and the marks here are the bill marks made by them as they probe down into the mud um, and sometimes you get the patterning of bill marks and bird marks at the same time one creature which um, is quite rare at Formby but does seem to have been there is the wild boar. Um, quite a, a, a distinctive foot shape there. And another one which I think is probably a beaver um, is this trail of footprints here. I've only seen this once um, and it's quite difficult to I really make be sure that it is um, a beaver. but. I've looked through endless books and this seems to be the most plausible animal for these footprints. So um, I just wanted to mention um, how we know that footprints are ancient um, and sometimes it is a bit difficult to tell because um, we have humans and ancient humans and we have animals that can look like um, aurochs prints, like horses. Um, on the beach as well. So sometimes um, you have to think quite carefully as to whether or not what you're looking at is actually archaeology or something much more recent. But we can tell that these footprints um, are ancient. Um, so this one is um, a bit of a degraded aurochs hoof print, but you can see here how the mud has been pushed to the side as it walked through when the mud was wet. When the mud's exposed, it's actually very hard and I could have stood on that and I might have left a small imprint with my boot but it would not have sunk down into the mud at all. Um, and again another reason is that you can see the depth of the impression into the mud here and again um, a little ripple of mud at the side. So the depth of the impression is something that is quite important for establishing a footprint's age. And with the human footprint there it looks as if it could be modern. It looks as if you or I could have made that. But the reason that we know it isn't is partly because that bed was very recently um, exposed, so it hadn't been visible for long enough to pe for people to walk in it. Um, but also because it's got a crack in the mud running through it here. If that footprint didn't have that crack, um, and if there weren't any other footprints associated with it, then I would have to classify it as a modern footprint because I wouldn't want to be recording things in error. Um, and here we have um, an, another conundrum that I think sometimes it's quite difficult to tease out what you're really looking at. So here we have um, a print 
you can see it's not very big. It's probably five centimetres across, but maybe five long. Um, a dog print. It looks as if it's gouged into the mud, but this is one of the features of dog footprints in the mud, that their claws are very sharp and they really do gouge into the mud and they can leave a trail. So I always get a bit upset when I see people let their dogs onto the mud at Formby because they can be quite disruptive to what you can interpret. But this footprint here is definitely an ancient footprint. You can see um, it's much more deeply embedded. Um, it's water filled, so um, it's um, had several tides wash over it without being washed away. And it's also significantly bigger. And one of the things with the, the ancient dog footprints at Formby is that their footprints were always round about seven centimetres long by about five centimetres wide, so they were quite big. They may have been wolves, but the difference between a wolf footprint and a dog footprint is really difficult to tell. Um, the wolf has a slightly narrower middle pad to the paw, um, but I think within a footprint in, in mud, it's actually quite difficult to distinguish one from the other. And again, human footprints don't always show up as a perfect human footprint like the one I just showed you. They sometimes show up as strange indents into the sand where somebody may have stood quite hardly on the um, lateral side of their foot and so they've impressed on one side rather than a flat footprint. And sometimes the footprint can be distorted. Here, the arch of the foot is quite distorted. And it may be that this person was actually sliding a bit in the mud um, you can see here that they've gripped with the toes and the mud has oozed up between the toes as it's gone into the mud. And again here, this is a plinth. So the footprint was actually above this plinth. Um, the, this, this is the remains of the, the, foot, the base of the foot. Um, all the wall of the footprint, this, this is the wall of the footprint here, is gone. Um, and so this footprint was actually made at a later date than the mud that it's sitting on beneath it. I mean, by that I mean this mud round here. Um, sometimes we do see really nice footprint trails, and this is one made by a man. I think he would have been about five foot six tall, um, and you can see the width of his foot. You can see the toe marks, you can see the instep, you can see the even stride as he walked along as well, right up here. Um, and this person was on their own. There weren't other footprints associated with it. Often you do find children with men at Formby, um, not necessarily walking in tandem, although that is a feature as well, but sometimes running around at the side as if they were sort of accompanying them, maybe learning by imitation or something like that, but um, not directly walking with the person. And then there's always the footprint that beats me, like this one. I don't know what it is. Um, it, it looks like a tiny hoof. Um, and I've, it occurs in one area of the beach. Um, so if anybody's got any ideas on that, I'd be very happy to, to hear them. So um, over time, I've developed a recording method that I've used for the footprints that has helped me quite significantly when I've come to analyze the data, because my interest is in looking at how humans and animals were using this prehistoric landscape. Um, and so in order to do that, I need to know who was there, um, what direction they were walking in, um, who they were walking with, and whether or not there were other footprints, um, other animals, you know, other people in the vicinity that might have had some relationship to them. Um, so it's been quite important to develop um, a bed um, naming system uh, use the GPS to mark in where these beds are because the coastline is constantly changing um, and um, make sure that they are properly geolocated. Um, within that bed it's very useful to have a context number even if the person after you're recording doesn't quite use the same context so they're very likely to use something very similar so it, it helps to be 
fairly accurate when you're trying to work out what level in the bed someone that was walking in. Um, and then footprints are, that they're associated with description of the bed, um, maybe a description of the mud around them can be quite helpful. Um, and another thing that is very useful to do um, is with your scale, take photographs. Sometimes it's useful to photograph um, a little bit of paper that says, you know, um, gypsy path bed, context one, or something like that, that you photograph first and then take your photographs after that. And always, um, I've told people to initial um, and date their work as well so that we can go back to a later date. And then we've also, um, I've developed a recording form for the footprints, called them features, um, and we've looked at where they are in the bed, who they're with, um, and the depth, the length, and the width of the footprint. Um, and again, I always like people, if they're working with me, to sign their work so that I can come back to them a year later when things are forgotten and um, ask them what they were recording at that time. So thank you very much indeed. I hope that this has been educational to you. Thank you.